Okay, we're going to start up again, just to keep ourselves on schedule a little bit here. So um, I'm very delighted to um, introduce uh, Leah Yoka. Um, and Leah teaches art history, cultural theory, and semiotic at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. <laughs> I just remember that in Greece. <laughs> she is the co-editor of the International Journal of Semiotic Punctum of um, Wangenpunkt. Vandenpunkt. Pardon me, in Munich, and prepares the biannual review of notes from the staff. She translates, edits, and writes for the Editions des Etrangers in Saloniki. <laughs> <laughs> Currently, she is editing volumes on the semiotics of urban space and on the politics of monuments which is going to be published by the Society for Art Historians. And she's writing on the history of nanotech and stem cell images. Very interesting. She has published on the history of comics, a critique of technoscience, and modern European painting and monuments. What a pleasure to introduce you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, it's definitely my pleasure and my honor to be here. Uh, thanks so much, Mahitudia, for inviting me. And uh, thank you, and Terry, for uh, Enzo for organizing this amazing event. Um, we're slowly having to accept digital art history that's talking about from an art historian point of view. Uh, and the digital humanities in general have not yet invented any questions, any new questions in cultural history nor do they answer any of the old ones. If anything, the early digital humanities often functioned as technocratic blindfolds, trying to make us forget that there still exist questions of cultural history at large, uh, and that they are more pressing than ever. Scholars and analysts, though, and many of them at this conference, have reached a point where they are raising a new, the important issues in art history before those degenerated into cultural studies or visual studies. Um, so they are posing cultural history questions again. Uh, according to the description of the theme of this symposium, advancements in computer algorithms, uh, algorithms are allowing images to offer us new sets of skills, analytical, immersive, socializing. Images themselves become these skills as media configurations and as knowledge resources. I'm the least equipped here to uh, deal with AR, VR immersion tools, uh, or social media, or forensic computational methods. So in terms of the analytical dimension of the digital visualizations, I think that in most fields, uh, and that's what I'll be scratching the surface of, academics, engineers, and users agree that enhanced informational methods like segmenting written text and pictures, will work far better with extended interpretive mediation and should ideally, as Julia Kuhn was suggesting yesterday, integrate embodied experience. Uh, programs like the ones uh, Maria Giulia Dondero, Enzo D'Armenio and Huda Lamquadam presented yesterday seem to be placing the descriptive technical and conceptual building blocks that will reconcile, so to speak, software with meaning and will bring closer the various branches of AR, VR, BDA on the one hand, and like the big picture with no acronyms, the forest on the other. Uh, my own interest comes from uh, a type of build wissenschaft and on how to reflect on the digital moment without crossing out the critical theory episode. Of course, after uh, Stefan Gunzel, I erased a few slides. Those that have remained <laughs> after Andrea Pinot's talk. I to be crossing out. Anyway, it is important for us who teach a lot, uh, teach a lot as opposed to doing a lot of research and writing a lot of books, that's what I mean, in countries with minimal research funds to devise, so we have to devise transdisciplinary pathways in order to turn our faith in the relevance of academic discourse into some useful general arguments. So my interest, in, my interest is in how to teach things like this, basically. And uh, 
since I have no experimental digital project to present, we're now just starting a project uh, investigating nanotechnology, astronomy, and stem cell visualization and iconography. So I hope we can deliver something by next year. Um, and it's, it's not this type of thing at all. Uh, so I will simply wonder how conceptual register, in what terms, following uh, what kind of tradition, or accepting what kind of spasmodic uh, genealogy, we could begin to approach and teach the discussion on augmented images, the one that would lead us to the digital terrain. So my three suggestions, the three uh, like areas I'm going to uh, only mention, really, uh, how I would start a suggestion, uh, uh, a discussion in class would be augmented image as worldview. And here I will uh, refer very briefly to the enduring currency of the uh, Rotman senior sphere. Augmented image and the question of style. Here I will recommend a rereading of Mayu Shapiro and augmented image and its relationship to genre. The overarching epistemic criterion in all three suggestions is how flexible it is to accommodate both the individual and the larger social scales, so collective to the mass uh, communication scale. Um, picking up on uh, Le Bon and other 19th century psychologists and historians, and, uh, Marx, Engels, etc., Hochheimer at some point tried to bridge early in his career, psychology and sociology. And that was an epistemological and political ambition that notably injected psychoanalysis into Marxism, which is a mark of the Frankfurt School. Already in uh, their very famous Kultur industry, um, where to Flintstone terms like spark this catchphrase, culture and industry, in dialectic of the Enlightenment, uh, him and Adorno proposed the popular culture is akin to a factory producing standardized goods uh, that are used to manipulate, uh, manipulate society into passivity. Uh, owing a lot to Walter Benjamin's interwar phantasmagoria that we talked about uh, today, uh, and that sees culture through the metaphor of the Liège optical device <laughs> <laughs> inscribed in the apparatus of mass communication that perhaps deliberately creates a kind of haze and confusion among populations through intervening in their everyday lives and ways of perceiving the world. Now, the notion of spectacle, uh, a bit later, another image augmentation, image as worldview, Symbolic of the commodity society where authentic life, understood in the Hegelian sense of authenticity, has been replaced by its representation, uh, was again very famously developed by Guy Debord. And the spectacle is, according to the fourth and most famous thesis, a social relationship between people that is mediated by images. Paraphrase is the Marxian thesis that capitalism is a social relationship between people uh, that is mediated by things. We know through the recent work of uh, Gabriel Zakaria that uh, these three uh, terms they actually also have some sociological links because uh, the ball must have been made familiar with both Marcuse's work and the Walter Benjamin's, although he didn't speak any German. In Lucas Axelotti, there's always a Greek in these things. <laughs> we saw it in Andriopoulos before, Malafour is uh, being uh, mentioned. Uh, in Lucas Axelos' uh, library, where they had the argument, the journal argument uh, assembly, and uh, the board would go there and listen to the elders and the Lefebvre, you know, and uh, that's where he uh, flicked through uh, Benjamin's and Marcuse's books, probably, and he came up with the spectacle. In other words, what had to be changed and surpassed was conception of time itself, the distinction between free time, spectacle, and time of labor, and possibly the forging of a new creative conception of time through the construction of self-created situation uh, through one's own unmediated experience, so-called authentic living, that can actually liberate us from alienation. Yet today, and I think uh, that came through many talks, it has become the norm to have the possibility to recreate and represent one's own experience 
with our own physical extensions of our, for example, mobile phone cameras. And that has only commodified direct experience and authentic experience rather than overcome alienation. Sorry, now from a different um, angle, uh, McLuhan extended an important part of the Frankfurt idea without any reference to it in his famous aphorism, Meeting the Message, elaborated in 19, 1964. Uh, where he calls attention to this intrinsic effect of communication media. Again, from a different angle, I think this um, creates a like, triple genealogy with uh, definite social and other types, uh, different angles on the French, combining systems theory and the anthropology of culture. Gregory Bateson turned uh, this idea on its head. Uh, beyond fragmentation, he saw unity, and instead of alienation, he saw immersive rituals with his ecology of mind. And uh, this is, I think, a very famous image of uh, a, a small video they made with uh, his then wife, uh, Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, which also shows up the links between the ecology of mind, uh, the neural networks, theory of mind, and hands-on ethnography. Um, some years after the society spectacle, uh, Foucault gave his own meaning to the early 20th century term biopolitics. And just like the spectacle, it is more than a disciplinary mechanism. It is a control apparatus exerted over population as a whole, but through individual bodies. In the next 20 years, this gave rise to a series of seminal texts in theorizing culture as communication technology and as consciousness itself. Um, in uh, 1982, the tattoo semiotician Yuri Lotman coined a contested but widely used term semiosphere, uh, inspired by, of course, the Nosphere, Biosphere, perhaps by Vernadsky. There's a whole discussion about who first initiated the term Nosphere. To Lotman, it meant, especially in the universe of mind, uh, it meant something that comes into being when two Umwelten are communicating with each other, somehow implying the relative independence of the semester to the communities of organisms that consist the Umwelten, that constitute the Umwelten. Yes, this is what I promised uh, you yesterday. This is Julia, Julia's artwork. Um, a watershed, according to Friedrich Kittler, the father of what today is study, the studies of media archaeology, um, texts and even software itself have vanished. There is no software, he said, our text producing gestures merely correspond to codes built on silicon and electrical impulses, and texts themselves no longer exist materially. And indeed, we have even seen to write them. All code operations come down to absolutely local string manipulations. And that is, I'm afraid, to signifiers of voltage differences. Uh, to this triple genealogy, we could also add somewhere in between Jacques Ellul's propaganda, propaganda and the Société Technicien, and the work of Günther Anders, and maybe also Karl Polanyi's work. On technology. Now, all the above emblematic concepts, whether they derive from literary studies like Lotman's philosophy or sociology and the new, like post philosophy critical theory, point to a series of interconnections between semi autonomized technologies of mass communication and are thus the object of media studies, although, or maybe because hardly any two of them share a common conception of the visual apparatus and of technology. So they really have a completely different conception. In all these um, spaces of thought, Denkheimer, because these concepts really encapsulate uh, very strong spatial uh, ideas. Uh, there are static spaces with boundaries that expand and broaden by external pressure. There are dynamic machines that shrink or inflate or even self-destruct. 
to performing du duplication, reproduction, transfer, turning into image abstracting, assimilating, internalizing. And there are finally also self-correcting organisms. Uh, that's the Gregory Bateson paradigm, more than Norbert Wiener one, with references even to material breathing space akin to a whole atmosphere, like culture is an atmosphere. Um, in all these concepts, there is no escaping its penetration into what Hegelians would call consciousness and phenomenologists perhaps perception. Uh, so I'm not, this is a parallel paper, so that you get an idea of what I'm referencing. Um, as for references to machines, for McLuhan, the expansion of the spatial metaphor blows up the distinction between form and content of representation. He's dwelling with the realm of the pure sign, which will later inspire both Lyotard, Lyotard, Villiot, Debre. Uh, content is not separate from form, because form, that is the medium of mass communication, is now an extension of our perception itself. It is an instrument, or rather an extra limb on our body, the prosthetics, as we uh, heard um, Paul to say this morning. Some find here a crux binding biosemiotics and cultural semiotics, like neurobiology confirms that this is how our brain works, and it can incorporate give the pan into our body so it can embody all the objects we use systematically and for a long duration so that when we are disconnected from a mobile phone or a prosthetic arm we feel the same pain we do when we lose a natural one so the important thing with the semiosphere i think is that it implodes and abstracts both the idea of the machine so the turing prototype uh, and the idea of the organism the ecology of the mind contact um, we just heard before the break uh, about Jonathan Crary. Actually, his latest book, Jonathan Crary, Crary is uh, notably an art historian, uh, published uh, in 2022, draws from this whole tradition of phantasmagoria uh, through Benjamin and uh, right up to the Anthropocene especially paying tribute to the thinkers in the critical tradition. Uh, and he worries that the networks and platforms of transnational corporations are intrinsically incompatible with a habitable earth and with the human interdependence needed to build egalitarian post-capitalist forms of life against the addiction to online simulation. Um, so he points to this innate pathology in the confusion and scales of immersion that lead to the permanent, a kind of permanent, permanent simulator sickness, we might say, if we remember uh, what you underestimated from Pinotti the uh, morning talk. Um, another feature these metaphors all share, and in this, I think, lie their function as definitions of both perception and of consciousness, and of culture at large, so they like merge these three concepts together, is that they result in streamlining the minds of people, thoughts, actions, habits, for purposes of population control, management, brainwashing, that would be the tradition of Adorno, Foucault, Debord, Guattari, quite different, two separate traditions. Others, with the same uh, mechanism, Announce, of course, with a warning, the building of a new community, like the McLuhan uh, trajectory. Lotman's semiosphere, on the other hand, semios semiosphera, somehow neutralizes this techno enthusiasm, techno pessimism of McLuhan and Hitler, as well as the malaise of alienated industrial life of the French and German paradise. So I think this is. Uh, like his um, liberating feature, and uh, that explains all, also his uh, currency. But most crucially, uh, the semi-sphere like produces cultural value separately from capital production, so it completely depoliticizes all the former paradigms. While the culture industry, for example, or the spectacle, transform every authentic use value into exchange value. So here, of course, lies the key political difference to uh, 
both the liberal and the, let's say, uh, left and new left approaches. Where Adorno and Horkheimer, for example, saw a continuum between liberalism and fascism, media studies paradigms collapsed the social and technological. Lothman imagined a kind of classicist empire of deeply rooted high and low literary signs that uh, grow in the periphery of the Soviet empire and then go beyond it. Um, for that, he constantly uses the notion of style and genre, but very liberally on various scales and with different meanings. Um, and despite of all this that Lothman does, uh, his notion of the semisphere is now used to the digital world, um, and even successfully so, I would say. So I go to part two of this discussion on uh, style, uh, taking the cue from uh, Lotman's pervasive use of uh, the notion of style to explain how the semisphere works in literature. That was that then directly migrated as a notion to the digital world. Gleaning definitions from a number of machine learning projects, uh, style is defined uh, within binaries that function at once as representational coordinates that have to be taken into account, factors of perception, so they, they are legible um, representational coordinates, and also design principles how to make things. So schematic, figurative, abstract, realist, form, content, style, meaning, analog, mimetic, and so on and so forth. And it's always defined as either in opposition to form or to content or to genre or to something, or to, that can even be coeval with them at the same time. So it's a very um, rhetoric, let's say, term. A parallel legacy, the exploration of uh, Warburg's Mimosini, or for Sion's life of forms, that of the work of Lithuanian-born American Mario Shapiro, spanning the short 20th century, a legacy that has yet to be mined, I think, and that might indeed prove more helpful in the project of anchoring digital art history in the fundamental historical and cultural, in other words, the interpretive questions, uh, I think opened the trajectory before the 15th and after the 17th century Western painting and sculpture. I think it's quite... Uh, interesting and characteristic, and this led me actually to this argument, that all the early digital art history pro projects deal with, you know, what they can deal with. Renaissance, uh, a little bit of high Renaissance, then uh, lots of Baroque, uh, because that provides a very specific grammar of conventions, uh, which is quite enclosed. So I'll just make three very quick points about Shapiro. Um, Uh, one about conventional science, form and style as expression or as content, and one about uh, style in genre. So throughout his work, Shapiro conceives style either as the opposite of an inherent form, for example, the standard form of what is the female form, as opposed to the different styles and genres of its representation. So style versus form, or as the opposite of content, for example, the enunciation, the landscape sujet as the different expressions of an iconic motive, so style versus content. Uh, it is, of course, the notion of the class of images, the categories, the dispositive or the status, the so called context that is at stake again, and that, that will decide how the analytical layers will be produced, scaled, and interpreted. I'll come back to that later. However, he's primarily a historical mind. And uh, he also sees a history of style, so a whole evolution and, uh, with, and a genealogy with breaks in style. Um, so it's the particular trait of an individual genius, or it's the development of culture at large. He also sees a history of form, the temporal classification of the Kilix shape in Roman archaeology, or the shifting regimes of realism. He's the first who said that realism is also a matter um, of degrees. Um, these two insights have been on the one side the object of art history since its birth as an academic discipline in the 19th century, at least in the German speaking world. Um, so I know I'm like repeating the obvious, but 
I think the fact that this takes up the analogy uh, with the notion of culture at large that is interesting and also usable for uh, today's discussions. Uh, the best examples uh, that are also whole areas resisting the style algorithm in uh, computation are, for example, primitivism and all pre-medieval Western art. Uh, I think very well-known examples. Shapira asks in the early 50s, what is the relationship of form or style, genre, and production of a culture in general? A culture he means a tribe in this case, like an ethnographic unit. If modern art, at least until the 1930s, is the last instance where the category of art still includes a specific type of planar images, then the concept of primitivism or even orientalism, an older phrase in the 19th century, one of its major trends are cases where the problem of using style in computation and indeed any effort to understand form and style as a problem becomes clear and concise. Shapiro says, much in the new styles, I have it somewhere here. Yes, uh, much in the new styles we call primitive art, modern artists were in fact the first to appreciate the work of natives as true art. However, the modern and the pre primitive differ in structure and content, two features that are external to style. Um, and modern artists with their more experimental attitude to forms feel attracted to the frankness and intensity of expression, blah, blah. Um, this comparative attitude to forms um, showed the way to the symmetrical study, I find it in the world Goldwater, uh, the symmetrical study between masks looted from Gabon and head sculptures by Brancusi in the design of any and every type of image reproduction and image processing, assimilation, taxonomy, software. In other words, cultural appropriation and co-optation can never be accounted for digitally. Yeah, they need lots of interpretive uh, asterisks because it is the very use of the principle of style as form of similarity right up to imitation, that disguises it. So a strategy of the image conceals its great functional, temporal, generic distance from another image through its similarity to it. Um, second point about Shapiro, the conventional sign, another very uh, much taught and well-known uh, series of examples. Uh, he has cast his heaviest shadow on medieval art history in his insistence that artistic style consists of a set of highly coded and then naturalized conventions and has thus rendered most Western art history a purely intersemiotic terrain, not just a semiotic one, like the uh, pictures refer to themselves in the Christian uh, iconographic, uh, let's say, ecology. Um, he would never use that term. He would laugh at that. Um, Everyone knows this uh, famous reading of the motif of the betrayal of Judas and the transformation of the purely conventional profile and unfast re representation, where Giotto, again, <laughs> is uh, the breakthrough moment where Christ and Judas are seen as equals because Giotto breaks with this convention of uh, unfast as uh, natural within the landscape and uh, uh, profile as somebody belonging only to the act of the perspective, or only to the action of the perspective and not exiting the uh, perspectival cube. If artistic representations already encode and further abstract visual comprehension, then their digital use is the result of an even narrower range of choices and parameters, the result of an abstraction of an even more winding complexity. Digital art history then has to deal with limits, with representational conventions, even more. In other words, it is important to use his insights for any consideration of gesture, um, like the uh, poses you were talking about yesterday, it's, uh, Julia Kuhn, it's very interesting, and its meaning in painting before the 14th century and after the 19th. Gesture is a code. Posture is a highly developed discipline, so it's even more highly encoded, that will gradually dissolve in more realist neoplatonic visual languages from the higher Renaissance to neoclassicism, and they are indeed perhaps very well suited to digitalize. 
digitalization and digitization. Um, Interestingly, Shapiro was also the first to describe drawing as an epistemic tool in a famous article in Semiotica in 1969, um, thereby definitely predicting the theorization of digital design today that uh, Joanna Drucker, the next speaker, has very elaborately worked on. We'll go to the third part on the idea of status um, and how it should be taken into account in Complication. Um, the notion of status, how you nominate an image and invest it with social value, truth, knowledge value, uh, ethical value, sensuality, is pending between the art historical and the literary rhetorical notion of style, individual technique, expressive modality, photography, art photography, diary, illustrated novel, on the one hand, and larger conceptual categories like art, science, ethics, religion, politics, on the other and can play a role in rearranging the two levels, genre, conceptual registers, and broader discursive spheres. So there are also kinds of semi-spheres if we want to neutralize this discussion as well. In this sense, the historical understanding of status accounts for all the conceptual and institutional changes within the artistic domain, or even within the category of the artistic of art, and can even be identical or coeval with the notion of cultural change itself. So it can actually help semiotics do history a little bit, I mean, enter the historiography. The image is not only contingent upon epistemic categories, but under certain circumstances, it also becomes a way to produce knowledge and it, and it is itself a field of knowing. Through the compositional principle that's so important in computation, and in digital art history, we come to the issue of genre as status, and status as, as a genre in art history and digital art history. My point here is that as soon as we try out the components of context, like economy of value, status, discourse, communicative circumstance, across a historical trajectory, some of the concepts more problematic, but also more productive methodological aspects become more highlighted. And again, I'll, I'll use only two very famous um, examples. While there's a lot of writing today that links compositional techniques of the avant-garde content creation in AR, for example, I was reading an article yesterday about uh, how photography, techniques of perception, and real-time media scapes by the impression can be used in order to uh, create uh, new uh, software and processing methods. So this is the idea of status I'm using. Borrowed from uh, this lady next to me, <laughs> uh, also in our uh, project. Uh, the truth is that there is no such thing as an impressionist genre or school that can be formally, stylistically, or compositionally constituted. Because impressionism, like all isms indeed, is a dial, and this is, uh, Alumine will know that uh, something that museum curators and artists first realized, uh, and then the MoMA and the Tate incorporated in their exhibition strategies, uh, they are all a dialectics of technique and content, style and meaning. So we cannot talk of an expressive claim that is common to impressionists, because impressionists are also uh, Monet and the more realistic paintings of the gap. It is in the dialectics of uh, technical rendering, let's say style, and the content, let's say reference, that impressionism, let's say, emerges as uh, a common uh, attitude towards vision. It is not a stylistic thing purely. And the same goes, of course, for expressions, where we can identify three completely different approaches to, um, to the planar image to expressive means, to te uh, technical methods, etc., use of brush, construction of, faith, of space, and all that. Two very famous examples of, of why status is a very problematic, but also very productive uh, notion, and with that, 
uh, I will move on to a summary and conclusion. Uh, Stephen Bann's semiotic analysis of proof based landscapes is, I think, the best case in point. Uh, the first example, this one, uh, points to the changing role of titles, uh, drawing from both uh, the Saussurian and uh, the Persian tradition. He said that the title uh, kind of functions as a guide for our visual deciphering of the picture and draws out the reading vectors and thus the interpretational path. And so we know because Kulbe calls it La Ronde Enfantine that we have to look at that uh, uh, children's game in the middle of the woods. And the second example, so it's not a stylistic thing and the, it's a status thing, but there you have to really know the convention of the context that changes, especially in the 1840s, and why this is linked to other larger cultural events. The second example brings forth the indexical character of the landscape genre, which in this case, why is it an index and it's not a direct landscape, what could they have done here? In this case, it fleshes out the deep bond, an umbilical genetic, genetic connection between the materiality of water, wood, vegetation, and minerals depicted on the one hand, and the origin of the painterly media of depiction, brush, canvas, oil paint, that come from minerals, water, wood, etc. So if we um, treat this as an 18th century landscape, we will not see this self-referential indexical character. And I will um, close. Long. Yes, if you like, if you... No, 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 no. no. I, well, I have a very short. It's almost but she, she told me that she can wait. Uh, so it's a eight, eight. Yes. Well, I'll leave five minutes for discussion. No, no, yes, sure, so, sure. No, no, uh, sure. She already knows that she has to wait. I can even, you know, um, stop it here. Just a yeah. summary, like uh, to recapitulate. I think concepts of culture and critical theory and critical media studies function as augmented worldviews and as metaphors for culture and consciousness at the same time. And I think this is a breakthrough in like, the Western continental uh, and analytical thought. Second, the issue of style depends on the dynamics within, its, within this cultural worldview that traverses all scales from the individual through the collective and co-individual to the mass. So it's an open question how to create algorithms that take into account for example, cultural appropriation or highly codified postures uh, that might change meaning, but not form over time. Uh, and that's why I suggest uh, Shapiro and primitive style or medieval art. And three, genre as status, context, semiotic register and art history is an exigendum and not a datum. So it's something that we should look for uh, rather than take for granted. And I think this question presses us to remain within the space of uh, cultural history. Thank you very much. Yeah.